So brand new book today, and book of Colossians, which I always find to be one of the more exalting books of Christ. Um, so I really, really enjoy this one. I hope you will too. Let's uh, open in a, a word of prayer. So our Father and our God, we come to you in the name of your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we take a look at uh, a, just another letter the Apostle Paul shares about you, pray that it would draw us nearer to you and Help us to see you clearly, more clearly than ever. And Lord, that just in all things, uh, you would work on our hearts uh, to have us be exactly who you intend us to be. Until we see you face to face, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the book of Colossians, we, we have the book of Colossians dealing, Paul's dealing with a heresy. He's dealing directly with a heresy in the church that's known today as the Colossian heresy. So the Colossian heresy that you'll see Paul developing arguments against was kind of this um, combination of Ju Judaism, paganism, Gnosticism, and Christianity, all blended together into uh, one false teaching. So... Uh, <clears throat> The heresy had a heavy emphasis on circumcision, dietary laws, observance of holy days, so it was very much attached to the Jewish law. But they also believed in various supernatural powers in creation that had Christ playing a very nominal role amongst that group. And they believed that the uh, body was evil from paganism. They believed the body to be evil. And that matter was evil. And that comes from the Gnostics, Gnostic teachings. Therefore, God can only create, they believe God can only create the world since matter was evil and, and the world is uh, made of matter. He could only do it through successive emanations of himself. So in his whole pure self, he couldn't create the matter that's evil. So there had to be these successive depleting emanations of himself until... So he gave an emanation of himself that was so apart from who he actually is that he could actually create matter. So um, since matter was evil, they formed two beliefs about it that are actually contradictory to one another. And one of those beliefs resulted in uh, asceticism where <clears throat> they believed that since the flesh is evil, you need to deny your flesh. You need to refrain from any kind of pleasure whatsoever and it's good for you to actually have your body suffer so they would whip themselves they would uh, punish themselves all the time and yet on the other side of that they would um, because they believed matter was evil there was another group that believed that because matter is evil that you should just be free to do whatever you want because to care for your body would be to care for evil so therefore, they, were, they, they had the freedom to eat or have sex or do whatever they wanted uh, with no limitations whatsoever. So you had your ascetics, and you had those that uh, were very licentious uh, about um, pleasure, and yet they called themselves Christian teachers after all that confusion. So they, they categorized themselves as Christian teachers. So Paul is trying to get that... Uh, that mixed salad of uh, belief systems uh, out of the church. So he's going to do that by simply preaching Christ, exalting Christ. That cleans a lot of things up, correct? So he begins his letter, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he calls them faithful brethren. So he's about to say, he's, he's going to mention all the mistakes that are going into the church, that they're not exalting Christ the way they're supposed to be exalting Christ. And before he gets into all these errors, what does he call them? Faithful brethren. Okay. So uh, despite differences, he knows that they're united in Christ. Our faith is has a stronger unity to it than any of our differences can tear apart. Our faith becomes a unifying factor. That's why we can have, globally, we have over 200 denominations that all call themselves Christian. Okay? 
So what, what is the unifying factor of all these different denominations? Okay, this is where we get our creeds from, right? We all believe the essentials uh, the same way, right? Christ died for your sins. He's the only savior. He's the only way to heaven. Um, we can't do it through works or anything like this. We're saved by grace through faith alone, through Christ alone. And our authority is scripture alone. So those unifying factors overcome our differences. Now, how important is that? Well, I literally lost track of when I mentioned this last time. I don't know if it was here or somewhere else, but I really learn a lot from what I see in Rahab's situation about, because this is a woman that has so many strikes against her, and yet because of her faith, she's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So how did she overcome all these obstacles against her? Let's look at, <clears throat> really quick, uh, Joshua chapter 2, starting verse 8. It says, as she's hiding the spies in Joshua 2, verse 8, it says, Now before they lay down, Rahab came up on the, to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came up out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. I want you to notice how she's quoting Exodus through, number, or Exodus through Deuteronomy, isn't she? So here's an outside source from the book of Joshua quoting Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. And here's why. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. So Rahab has come to faith, right? When she heard these stories, she believed them. And isn't that what makes all of the difference? It's believing. Now, this isn't a belief where now that she's in a dangerous situation, she just cares for her own safety. This is a belief where she's actually now siding with the people of God despite the danger of her own people, okay? Faith, there's feet to her faith. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I've shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. So the men, the Jewish soldiers, the men answered her, our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours. And it shall be when the Lord has given us the land, they will deal kindly and truly with you. So she, now, how does she go from Gentile enemy prostitute? Um, she's a Canaanite, and the Canaanites come from Ham, and Ham has a curse on him from Noah, yet that she's in that curse and yet she's making a covenant with the people of God. She's also um, condemned by the law of Moses because the Canaanites are to be removed from the land. So she's got that law of Moses against her. She's got the curse of, <coughs> of Ham against her. She's a female, which normally they're not going to be able to negotiate with the men. And she's a prostitute. So with all of that, how does she enter into a covenant with the people of God? It's simply because she showed a great faith. Her faith has overcome all of her obstacles. She's, um, she has a remarkable faith. Her faith makes God's grace sufficient for her. She's in desperate need of God's grace, and her faith gives her access to the grace of God because covenants have the power to overcome curses. Okay, she's entering to a covenant, and with all these curses that are against her, she overcomes them all simply because she said, I heard and I believed. And that's how we Gentiles are saved. Okay, so God intended uh, salvation for the Jew first, and now I have a room full of, if not all Gentiles, certainly mostly Gentiles, who have received saving faith. Why? Because your faith is overcoming the fact that you're not the original people of God, right? You've been entered into covenant through faith. So, um, verse 3, back to Colossians 1. 
Paul says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you have heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you, and is, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. So I want you to notice the three key words in this text that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 13. You see those three very familiar words, faith, hope, and love. Now, Paul has them in a different order here. He says, I've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, heard of your love for all the saints. Why? Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. So, faith is a commitment to or trust in another person. Now, what does this look like, though? Faith is a commitment to or trust in another person. Now, if you're looking at the notes, I'm giving you about 29 verses out of John chapter 6. We're not going to go through all those 29 verses. But that is the absolutely incredible passage where Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus announces to, when he has large crowds following him, he had recently fed the 5,000. And that, I always marvel at that because, you know, it's not like Jesus advertised, hey, I'm going to do a teaching on a certain day at a certain time and all of that. There's going to be free lunch, all that. He just wakes up and says, all right, I'm going to start teaching. And he's got thousands following him, okay? And there came a time where Jesus decided he's going to find out who's real deal, okay? Who's actually in this for me and not because I can feed their bellies magically, so he shouts out to the crowd, hey, unless you eat, now that's what they're there for, eating, right? He says, unless you eat my flesh, you have no life in you. Now I want you to imagine if you were in that crowd. I want you to imagine you've been amazed by this man, you're amazed by his teachings, you've seen miracles, you know there's nobody like him, period. That's why you're following him. And as you're in this mass of bodies, you hear him turn around, it's like, Everybody listen up. He's talking, he's talking, he's saying something. And then he says that. And you got to know they're murmuring amongst themselves. Did we hear him right? Okay, what does that mean? And now when you upset a large crowd that's following you, what do you see like every politician in the world do at that point? They start backing up on it, right? It's not what I really meant, you know, what I actually said. But here's what Jesus does. He says, hey, <laughs> I forgot to say something in there. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Okay? I'm afraid, I think God didn't allow me in that crowd because I'm afraid I'd be one of the ones that walked away. It's a hard saying to hear. Okay? Now the, the advantage they had is they saw the miracles, they were fed miraculously, they know there's something about him. And what I think Jesus is saying in John 6 is, You've seen enough to be loyal to me, so now let's see where your heart is. Is it on getting the miracles, or are you really focused in on who I am? So he gives them the test. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. The conversations must have been intense in that crowd. This is John chapter 6, and in verse 66, which just so happens to be John 666, for whatever that means to you, that verse says many people walked with him no longer. There's the work of the devil, right? It's all he's got to do. He doesn't have to show up and scare you to death. He just has to get you to walk with him no longer, and he wins. It says many people walked with him no longer. And unlike any church leader today, when they see people leaving their church, they're going to go after him. Jesus doesn't. Why? He wants to know who actually knows him well enough to be very confused about him and yet stay. And so he even looks at his 12 at that moment. He says, do you want to leave me too? And that's where we actually get the ingredients of what it takes. What kind of heart does it take to stay with Jesus amidst your utter confusion about Jesus? Because we don't have all the answers, do we? Life happens in a way where we scratch our heads and we go, really, God? Seriously? Right? It happens to everybody. 
This is your John 6 moment. The moment you're going, did he say that? Is he doing that? What's going on here? Okay. And he looks at his 12 and says, do you want to leave me too? And Peter gives us two great answers that will help you hold on in any circumstance. First answer, he says, where are we to go? You have the words of eternal life. Meaning, you walk away from Jesus, you walk away from eternal life. Okay? So that you have to know right off the bat. And then he says, and here's why he's able to say that. He says, because we have come to know and to learn that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So if you know Jesus that way and realize if that's who he is, there's nowhere else to go, you forfeit eternal life by walking away from Jesus, then that's going to allow you to both be confused about him and yet stay. Because this is John 6, and months and months, I would say probably about 18 months will pass between John 6 and John 13. And then as you know, in John 13, he'll hold up a loaf of bread at the Last Supper. And as he directs her attention to that loaf of bread, he'll say, this is my body, which is broken for you. And they had to go, thank the Lord that's your body, because I can eat that, right? He'll hold up a glass of wine. This is my blood. Thank goodness I can drink that. But they had to stay, didn't they? They had to stay through John 6 to John 13. So you might want to ask yourself, I wonder how many conversations they had going, hey, when he holds out his arm and says it's time to eat him, are you going to take a bite? <laughs> right? How do you not have those conversations, right? Okay? But whatever, whoever he is, whatever he's about, whatever impact they made on him made them stay. Has he made that impact on you? Can you stay no matter what? Do you realize there's nowhere else to go? Do you realize that he's the Christ, the son of the living God? Okay? And that you can trust him. Because for every John 6 moment you have, there is a John 13 answer. Whether he reveals it to you or not, whether it's this side of heaven or the other side of heaven, there is a John 13 answer about your John 6 confusion. Okay? So when we talk about faith, that's what we're talking about. Faith does not mean you get all the answers. Faith means you know him well enough to know to continue with him even when you don't have the answers. That's true faith. So he says, I heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. What else did he hear? Of your love for all the saints. Now, we can't think of love as a feeling. And that's hard to hear because that's what we think love is. It's this feeling. It's this feeling. But that's not the love that's being discussed here. This is a love that's a choice. It's a decision you're making every time. This is a type of love that you could actually vow to have forever. Why? It's what you do in marriage. You're promising somebody something when you're 24, and you're saying, hey, even when I'm 84, I'm still going to love you. Now, if it's about feelings, you have to say, well, how do you know that? How do you know what your feelings are going to be in 60 years? But that's not what you're vowing in marriage. You're vowing to always choose to love them. You're making a choice to be loving, to make loving choices, to talk lovingly, to behave lovingly. Because guess what God's going to do with your feelings when you've decided to love? He's going to make your, give you feelings of love. Okay? So what's the problem with marriages today? People are led by feelings. They don't feel the same. It's all about feelings. They make me feel this way and feel this way. Well, make a choice and make a decision to be loving, okay? to love, do what you said you would vow to do, okay? Because I know I've behaved in ways where I think God would say, you're really hard to love right now. But thankfully, God doesn't go, so I just feel like giving up on you, right? I'm going to choose to die for you. I'm going to choose to stay faithful to you even when you're faithless to me, right? God's decided to be faithful to the end, and he's asking us to decide the same thing. So that's why there's no commands to like people. Okay, because <laughs> God knows we can't do that, right? But what you can do is love people, quite frankly, okay? And then he gives us this word hope, okay, this word hope, all right? So hope is not the hope that you experience Sunday afternoons at kickoff, because that gets disappointed quite a bit, correct? I didn't name a team, okay? I didn't name a team. Okay, it's virtually everybody, unless you're probably a Kansas City fan, right? So, 
It's not that hope. Biblical hope is a hope that says, I have to wait for the thing that I've been promised. So I wait and hope for it. But it's God who promised, so it's coming my way. And I wait and hope for it. So, so Paul says, listen, hurt of your faith in Christ Jesus, your love for the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. You see how it's laid up for you in heaven, right? Okay, so all you got to do is die. That's it. Okay, and it's yours. Now, when Paul mentions these in 1 Corinthians 13, he says the greatest of these is, why? When you go to heaven, do you need to have faith? When you go to heaven, do you have to have hope? When you go to heaven, do you need love? It's the only one that's eternal, right? It's the only one that will never, ever, ever stop. Hope will be fulfilled, right? Faith will. He says, you'll no, you'll no longer see as a dimly lit mirror. You're going to see him face to face. Your faith will be fulfilled. Your hope will be fulfilled. Love is that thing that will go on and on and on and on and on. It's the greatest thing we have is love. All right. Verse 9. He says, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So he gives us this phrase, knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, one of the things I love about the Christian faith is how distinct, unique, and different wisdom is from the world. Um, Personally... You know, going through high school, getting into college, picking my major, getting my bachelor's degree in my major was all 100% based on worldly wisdom. It was a finance degree, and I hate finance. But that was my calculation of earning the most amount of money in my lifetime. So let me get the finance degree and try to have the income come in at the highest levels possible. You have to know that I didn't switch the teachings. I thought that that would fulfill that. Okay? So, um, but I got a different wisdom as my eyes opened to God, and I started discovering that what I was pursuing as valuable lost its value in my eyes, and other things became much more valuable to me. And God, once I had that wisdom, all of a sudden, I literally went from leaving the Catholic Church, stepping into a Protestant church for the first time in my life, not even knowing you could preach the word without robes and chains and everything. When the preacher got up, I thought he was just there to give the announcements because he was dressed in regular clothes. And I'm like, who's this guy? Here comes the announcements. He opened the word, started preaching, and I was very uncomfortable. I was like, they just let anybody walk in and, and preach the word. And then he mentioned his wife. And I went, why is he saying that out loud? You know, and then he mentioned his children, and I was tempted to stand up and go, that man's had sex, (laughs) and he's preaching the word of God. This makes no sense to me whatsoever, okay? But I was told to go by my sister because she stepped into that church the week before and told me, I learned more in one Sunday than I've learned my whole life, and that's the experience I had. I just, it just, the Bible was coming alive in one sermon, coming alive, And then I'll never forget the worship leader getting up, sang a solo of How Great Thou Art, and I could not stop weeping through that song. I knew everything was different. Okay, I knew everything was different in that moment. I got a knowledge of his will, and I got spiritual understanding. I understood spiritually what that man was saying. And if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I love this. this. This is one of the things that just has always come to life for me. Verse 18, 1 Corinthians 1, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Don't you see that out there? But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Why I love that is it couldn't be more opposite. It's either foolishness or it's power. Okay? To those who are perishing and to those who are being saved. It's the exact opposite thing. And that's why... I'm drawn to this thing. 
I love that they put a sign over Jesus' head on the cross. He's naked and bleeding. He can barely breathe. He's been beaten to a pulp. He's been whipped almost so he doesn't have skin on his body anymore. And then they said, here's the king of the Jews. And guess what? Those of you who are saved, you actually picture that and you want to worship him. There's nothing that looks worth worshiping there. But you want to bow your knee to that guy. You want to give your life over to that guy. All the other kings look worthy of worship. Gold crowns, not crowns of thorns. Luxurious robes, not naked and bleeding. Yet, some reason, we see that and we know it's for us. We just know it's for us. We know that we are on his mind. We know that it's his love for us that made him want to do that, made him want to die. And so we understand that he is a king, even though there's zero indication on the cross, there's zero evidence of it when he's hanging on the cross. And as they put a mocking sign over his head, we don't see the mockery. Why? Because you have spiritual understanding. Okay? You understand a great price is being paid because we can't be holy as we were commanded to be holy. So God himself is paying that price. It's a knowledge of his will and, and spiritual understanding. Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, For I determined to not know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. <laughs> we don't point to David on his deathbed and go, look what a great king, right? We point to his warrior activity and go, look what a great king. We're looking at Jesus Christ, and here's what Paul said, and him crucified. That's, that's his, his kingship right there. All right. Verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. In that John 6 story that I was sharing with you, it talks about what they had heard and what they had learned. What they heard and what they learned. That's why I love that, you know, this is not Sunday church or anything like that. You guys are tired. You guys are busy and everything. But look where you are right now. You're hearing. You're learning. There's something uh, divine about that. Uh, I'm going to brag about, um, I have about 40, sometimes 50. I've had up to 60. Uh, students at CCA that I just tell them, hey, Wednesday's at lunch. I'm not going to lunch. I'm staying right here in my room. I'm opening my Bible. I'm teaching. If you want to hear it, come in. And it's packed. The seats are full. The kids are sitting all over the floor. This is their social hour. This is their time to get out of classrooms and everything. But I've been doing this for years, and kids have been packing the room for years. Okay, that requires a spiritual understanding. They're increasing in the knowledge of God. They're hearing and they're learning. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, and I don't advertise it. I don't make it an official club because I don't, I don't want to give them other reasons to come. Your reason to come is just the Bible's open. You want to hear it? Let's go. Let's do it. All right. Verse 11. He says, uh, Increasing knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Paul mixes these, these words as if they belong in the same sentence together. Look at these words in one sentence. He says, strengthened with might for patience. Patience requires a lot of strength, doesn't it? Okay? Hot-tempered people think they're strong and everything, and they're, they're mouthy, they're loud, and they're trying to get their way, and they don't show any patience. It's got to be now, now, now. The Bible says they're weak. They don't have the strength to, to be patient. They're not strengthened in might for all patience and long-suffering with, here's how we suffer, with joy. Okay, we just finished Philippians, correct? Paul in prison, waiting a death sentence, literally going, please let it be death, please let it be death. Okay? But if I go on living, it's going to be for fruitful ministry for you. Okay? Now, just teaching that verse a week ago tonight, let me tell you something. Had an opportunity to use that verse with a very dear friend of mine 
who got very, very bad medical news, and she was able to say, I'm, I'm ready, I'm just worried about my family, okay? So she knows how to suffer with joy, okay? So I, I marvel that I got to see somebody living out the very thing that we were teaching the Wednesday before, okay? Literally doesn't know how long she has. She doesn't know how long she has. And yet, she stated two things. I'm ready. I just want to make sure those that I love are cared for. Okay? So that's what strength looks like. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. And then you think, great, we're going to go take down armies. No, it's for your patience so that you can be patient. Okay? And you can suffer well, suffer long with joy. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Okay, now these are not words we use in our everyday language. We've got to say, what does Paul know that's making him use this type of language, these very words? Well, first of all, he says, here's what we're doing as we consider all this. We're giving thanks. And I know you've heard me say this before. I'm going to say it again. I think that is the most underutilized Christian discipline in our life today is thankfulness, okay? Um, if you simply just start giving thanks for everything, absolutely everything, I think you're going to find you're more mentally healthy, emotionally healthy, spiritually healthy. I think any demons you have with maybe alcohol or anything like that, you're going to see that diminish. I think you're going to start seeing the things of God become more beautiful to you. And I think you'll start despising the things that are against God even more. I think you'll be lining yourself up with him more and more. I really believe thankfulness is the key to understanding God better or seeing God better, sensing God more, enjoying sunrises more, sunsets more. Okay, I think I somewhat embarrassed myself by sharing with you how much I was enjoying the birds chirping in the morning. And one of you lovely ladies actually sent me audio recordings of birds chirping. And that was wonderful, yes. Okay, I also enjoy random gifts of cash. Okay, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just see the beauty in that. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> You're on to me. You're laughing. All right. <laughs> All right, now... As he says now later in this verse, he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints, and then he says, in the light, in the light. Okay, now, not very specific, not a whole lot to go on with that, but in really looking at Paul's theology of resurrection, and this idea of 30, 60, 100-fold reward that Jesus teaches us and that monetary things aren't what it's all about, so it's not monetary rewards in heaven. It's probably not possessions in heaven. So what could this possibly be? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul takes pains to say that there are stars in the heaven that differ in glory one from another. One star has one kind of glory, another star has another kind of glory, the sun has one kind of glory, the moon has another kind of glory, and you're like, thank you, astronomer Paul. But then he says this, so is the resurrection from the dead. He says, you're going to vary from one another in your glory, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100. And what adds to your glory? Your sincere and authentic heartfelt service to the Lord. That the things that concern other people be actually become more important to you than the things that you concern yourself. Because remember, Jesus said that um, why do you worry about tomorrow? He says, the, the birds, they don't think about what they're eating tomorrow, yet God feeds them every single day. And you're worth more than many birds. Right? Okay? So, Psalm 23, 1 says, when the Lord is shepherding you, it gets rid of your wantiness, right? I shall not want. Why? The Lord's my shepherd. He's leading and guiding. He's supplying. He's 
watching over my cares and concerns. Now, why is it important that you realize that you can take your hands off your wheel, for, the hands off your wheel for you, your hands off the wheel, because now you're dependent on Christ. Now Christ is going to show up and you're going to realize the only explanation for your well-being is Christ. Okay? So now that you know Christ that way, you're perfectly positioned to start paying attention to other people. Okay? Your salvation is now going to benefit other people. Um, so, and I think that will affect your glory. You're going to vary from one another in glory. Okay, some like the sun, some like the moon, all in heaven, all filled with joy. But there's a varying glory that Paul talks about. So here he says, you have an inheritance of saints where? In the light. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Don't you love how he puts that? You're going to the kingdom of the son of his love. It's his kingdom, the son that he loves. How many times does God say, this is my son whom I love, right? This is my son whom I love. That son has a kingdom and you're being conveyed into that kingdom of the son of his love. And what does that kingdom look like? Well, according to Jesus in his parable telling, it looks a lot like a wedding feast going on. When Paul speaks about Jesus Christ, he does so in a way that reveals Christ's true identity and power in exalted and unusual language, like we see here. This is because Jesus Christ is not man deified, nor is he God humanized. Rather, he is indissol indissolubly divine and human. This is that hypostatic union that I spoke about before. I'm not going to unpack again. So as we consider the next verses that we're going to start getting into here, we're going to see they speak of Christ's nature and given purpose, his power, his preeminence, his authority, his fullness, and the reconciling work he did for us at Calvary. Verse 14 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So it says he's the image of the invisible God. Now we get other language that speak of Jesus's similarity or exactness of, of the Father. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is sh shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Now, where do we find this light of the glory of God? It says it's in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image. What are the words that are going to be used now? From glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, listen. You ever feel like you're not worth much? You have to understand, you are being prepared to be transformed into the same image of Christ from glory to glory. We're being transformed into His glory, that glory of the Lord God that's in the face of Jesus Christ. You are being prepared to partake and dwell in that glory, to receive that glory. Okay, so that's why it says you should walk worthy of the call of Christ. So look like somebody who's being prepared to walk in that glory. Think of, the, think of your work behavior, your home behavior. Think of the different roles that you play and how you play out those roles. Are you looking like somebody who's in training for glory? Because that's who you are. God is working glory in you to dwell in glory for all eternity. Now it says he's the firstborn. It says here he's the firstborn of creation. Now, this does not mean he's created by any sense of the matter. Okay, firstborn is, a, is, is in privilege and in position as well as being the firstborn from the dead, meaning he's the firstborn to rise to never die again. 
He's setting the precedent of death is not the end. You're going to live eternally after your death. So he's, he's um, first born in those ways. Now, as far as that's concerned, I love this uh, quoting of the book of Hebrews of Psalm chapter 40, starting in 6 through 8. In Psalm 46 through 8, we actually have a conversation between God the Father, Jesus the Son, some time in history past, before, before Jesus was incarnate. And as you read through Isaiah, and you see how God is frustrated with the sacrificial system. Their hearts are not in the sacrifices. They're just doing religious routine, religious routine, religious routine. And God says he's sickened by their behaviors in the sacrificial system. It means nothing to him anymore. So with that, with that in mind, Jesus says to his father, Sacrificing an, sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me, and I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law was within my heart. Now, what is the best interpreter of Old Testament verses? New Testament authors, right? New Testament authors are the best interpreter of Old Testament. So there, we're going to have the author of Hebrews unpack that conversation between Jesus and the Father. This is found in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 5 where this is quoted. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, when Jesus came into the world, he said, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire. This is a quote from Psalms. But a body you've prepared for me. So the sacrificial system ain't cutting it for you, but a, rather a body you prepare for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. And the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. There's your Lord. This whole idea of sacrificial system is not cutting it for you, God, but rather you desire that you give me a body, I'll put on flesh, and I will become the sacrifice. I will do your will, O God. It's amazing. Verse 16. For by him, Jesus, all things were created. Do you know Jesus... As creator, this this whole idea in the beginning was the word, the word is with God, word was God, that word became flesh dwelt amongst us. In that John passage, it says, all things were created by him and without him, nothing was made that has been made. He's the word. God speaks the word. The word is the energizing creative power of God that's creating. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, All these were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead, meaning the one that's going to rise to never die again, that that in all things he may have the preeminence. Again, I don't know who said this. I should really look it up. I think every time I say that, Diana texts me who said it, and I never keep it. But somebody smart once said, there's not a molecule in the universe that Jesus doesn't stand upon and say, mine. It's mine. It's his. Okay. If you look at the uh, apologetics courses that are on the website, you'll see the whole breakdown of the law of cause and effect and everything that's in our universe, and there is absolutely no atheistic explanation for life coming from non-life, for um, matter coming from non-matter, for intelligence coming from non-intelligence, for personhood coming from non-personhood. All these things that exist in our universe are absolutely, there's no explanation for them being here unless there's some powerful, intelligent, personal agent outside this universe that created it. So follow the science. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. He says in Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given unto me. John 13, 3 says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. 
There's nothing in existence that's not under the direct control of Jesus Christ. Anytime we feel like the world is out of control, we have to realize that's just our feelings. That's just our limited understanding and comprehension. All things are in the hands of Christ. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. All the fullness of God should dwell. So listen to Romans 1. All the fullness of God should dwell in him. Romans 1, 3, and 4. This is Paul in, Paul's introduction of the book of Romans. He says in verse 3 and 4 about Jesus. He said, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David. If you're born of the seed of David, you're a human being, right? If you're born of the seed of David, you're a human being. So he says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and he was declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So that he is indeed a seed of David, a human being, but he's declared to be the son of God because when he died, he got up again. Death couldn't hold him. So he's both man and God in fullness. And that's what Paul, Paul's saying here in Colossians. It says, all the fullness of God dwells in him. In Philippians chapter 2 that we covered a few weeks ago, it says that Jesus did not consider his equality with God something to be crass. So what does Jesus actually have with God? Equality. Can any person ever say that? That there's no ranked difference between this person and El Shaddai, God Almighty. Okay? So Jesus will say things like this. Hey, don't you know that if you've seen me, you've seen my Father? Okay? Now, would that make any sense if I said that to you? Hey, why don't you bring your dad here? Don't you know that if you've seen me, you've seen my father? Okay? It only makes sense in their context. All right. Verse 20. And by him, Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Isn't it interesting? That in the work of reconciliation, Jesus is not just reconciling our, ourselves to him, but all things on earth and in heaven. Okay, that's a whole other whole nother topic. Um, all right, verse 21. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Stop there for a minute. Now, first he says, you were once enemies in your mind by your wicked works. God told Isaiah to put it this way, even your righteous deeds are like filthy rags in my sight. Even your righteous works are like filthy rags in my sight. This is our, our condition apart from salvation. So he says, even your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. But then in Isaiah 118, he says, come, let us reason together. It's amazing that God's willing to look us in the eye and say, now let's be reasonable. Okay, let's be reasonable. And when you study apologetics, you'll see unbelief is simply being unreasonable. Everything supports this faith. I don't care if it's... Um, I don't care if it's archaeology, biology, cosmology, history, epistemology, all these converging lines of evidence, the best explanation for all of it is the Christian story. Any other worldview that somebody holds is a compromised version of the evidence. And that's what truth would do, correct? It would have all the evidence converging on it, if it's indeed true. And that's what we find in Christianity. Now... God, God's saying, listen, so just reason with me. Just be reasonable. Though your sins are like filthy rags, though they're red and scarlet and stained the color of blood, he says, they shall be white as snow. He says, they shall be white as wool, white as snow. They are 
deep, dark stain like scarlet right now, but they shall be white as snow. And I want you to know that he uses both wool and snow for his descriptions of how white he wants to make our souls. Because those are things from nature that are white, right? The snow and the wool is all from nature. It's all very natural, which means the scarlet and the crimson is not true to your nature. That sin is not true to, to the nature of who you are made to be. Sin is contrary to the nature that you were created to be in. It's natural to your sin condition. And if you're not going to be reconciled from your sin condition, then that's your color, is the color of blood. But your natural color of God's intent from creation, the creation narrative itself, is the natural colors of white. So when Jesus brings up his three closest apostles, the ones that are in the deepest training for discipleship, he brings up Peter, John, and James up on a mountain, and he allows them to see his transfigured body into his heavenly form. And the only thing they could describe it as, it was a white, than, it was whiter, he was whiter than any bleacher could ever bleach. Okay? That means it's a shade of white we haven't seen yet. We've seen bleached white, right? But it says, no, it's whiter than that. Okay? So Jesus took on a shade that is not earthly. It's not of this world. It's different, and it's bright, and it's clean. And you're being transformed into that image. It says, though your sin has darkened you into the blood colors, you shall be. It's not too late. You haven't... You can't do so much that the cross doesn't cleanse you. Okay? You shall be white as snow. Verse 20. And in him to, or 21. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Now, this little tiny word in Greek, it's, it looks like an E and an I. It's an epsilon and a yoda. In English, it's the word if. And it, it, it sets the condition for the promises. Okay? I want you to think about what I'm saying because I'm, I'm giving you two different views of Christianity here. There's an if here. When are you, how are you going to be... Uh, how are you going to be presented holy and blameless and above reproach in the sight? This says, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. There is a harmony between the complete and utter sovereignty of God and your freedom to blow it all. It's just in the scriptures. It's not a dent in his sovereignty, but in fact, when Paul in Romans 8 says there's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ that's in Christ Jesus. No height, no depth, no angels, no principalities, no powers. Nothing in the created order, he said, could possibly separate you from the love of God that's in Jesus Christ. What didn't he include in that list? You. So there's nothing outside of you that can separate you. The devil can't come and separate you from the love of Christ. Uh, tragedies can't separate you from the love of Christ. Um, circumstances can't separate you from love. Nothing can separate you. But the one thing that he'll go on to say is, if you continue in this faith. Satan does not have the power and authority to separate you from Jesus Christ. Only you can do that. Okay? There is no, the devil made me do it in Christianity. Okay? Okay? All right, verse uh, 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and here's a very controversial verse, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. If you get 10 books explaining that verse, guess how many different understandings you're going to get? Yeah, 11 or more, I promise you. All right, now, what do I think about that? I'm glad you asked. All right. Well, <clears throat> Jesus suffered completely and totally. The only thing different between his suffering and Paul's suffering is you see that an age changed. There's the Jewish age and the Gentile age. Okay, Jesus was in the Jewish age. His death and resurrection brought in the Gentile age. 
In fact, they, under, they knew there was, was going to be an end of a Jewish age. Their prophet Hosea told them, saying, there's going to come a time when people that are called as people will no longer be called as people. There's going to be an end of this Jewish age. So when the apostles ask, what's the end of the age? They're not asking about the end of the world. They're asking about the end of the Jewish age. Okay, so there's an end of that age. And Jesus completely filled up in his sufferings completely for that age. Now, Paul's in a different age. He says, now I'm filling up what's lacking, and that is for the Gentile age, is what I think he's saying. And I could be wrong. But if I thought I was wrong, I would say something different then. All right? So he's filling up what's lacking in this new age. Um, so, so he says... For the sake of his body, which is the church, that's why we're suffering, for this church, to which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is this mystery among the Gentiles? Before he says the mystery is that the Gentiles are included. Now he's saying to Gentiles, now that you know you're included, there's a mystery that's amongst you. And guess what that mystery is that would blow the Jewish people away? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, That Christ would actually be in the relationship with the Gentiles of actually being in them. And this goes back to you have to eat my flesh, drink my blood, correct? So it's Christ in you and that becomes your hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So how can those whose who sins make their souls like filthy rags be perfect in Christ Jesus? You can never be perfect once you're imperfect, right? Perfect means perfection always, okay? So... If you're, if you're made perfect, you still have a sinful past. So how in the world can you actually be made perfect? You're going to have to have somebody else's righteousness that's not yours. Sin has tainted your righteousness. It's literally going to take a brand new righteousness upon you. So not only did Jesus die for your sins and he imputes the sin stain of your life upon himself and receives the wages of your sin, which is his death, he also is imputing his pure white perfect righteousness onto you for your account through your faith in him. So we 99 times out of 100 hear that he died for you. We very rarely hear that he lived for you. He was living through those 33 years needing to maintain perfect righteousness because that's what he's going to offer you. He's got to have it to offer it to you. So he imputes his righteousness to your account as your sin gets imputed to his account. Okay. So now you're presented perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So we have these glimpses of this Christ in the Gentile, the hope of glory in the Old Testament. We already brought up Rahab. Who else can you bring up? Ruth. Do you know our greatest... Examples of Gentile faith before Christ are women. Rahab and Ruth. Um, we also get Uriah the Hittite. We also, in the New Testament, we get the Syrophoenician woman, which is one of my favorite stories. Okay, you get a woman, Gentile woman approaching Jesus Christ with a very sick daughter, desperate for her to live, so she approaches the Jewish rabbi and asks him to heal. And Jesus wants to make a point of this conversion of him going from a God of the Jews to a God of the Gentiles. And he uses this occasion because he'll say something stunning to this woman, out of character to this woman. He says, I've only come to the lost sheep of Israel. And he's provoking her because he knows her faith. And he wants that invisible faith to become audible now. So he says, I've only come to the lost sheep of Israel, which makes her say, but even the dogs, which Jews called Gentiles dogs. And she said, even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. 
saying, I just need crumbs from you. It's all I need. Sprinkle a crumb and my daughter will live. Do you realize the faith she has in him that she puts her entire daughter's life on his crumbs? Just let some crumbs fall my way and I'm good. And Jesus recognizes her great faith. That she's got this, the Roman centurion, same story. You don't have to come under my roof, Jesus. Just say the word and I know my servant will be healed. Jesus literally turns and looks at his Jewish followers and says, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. Right? So we see this transition from the Jew to the Gentile through these stories. And then Paul gets assigned as the messenger and the apostle to the Gentiles. And he rejoices greatly in that that he gets to reveal the mystery that the Gentiles are going to be called in to conversion while he still has a heart for the Jews and looks forward to their complete salvation one day as well. Amen. Father, we thank you for uh, your word. Lord, we thank you for Christ in us, the hope of glory. Lord, we thank you for his purity being Im imputed to us and, and your call, Lord, for us to walk worthy of this calling, Lord, to walk worthy of the glory that you've stored up for us and we wait for it in hope, Lord. And I pray that we can become more of a Christian body that our witness isn't just how we live life. It doesn't even have to be how we speak, Lord. But the light would just shine from the lives that we live and, and the generosity and the, the care and the prayers that go for other people, that they would know that we spent time with Jesus. There'd be no other explanation, Lord, I pray for our lives, except that we spent time with you. And may this be truer and truer of our lives every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.